We are live for another Thursday live stream from Truth Proof, and uh, welcome to the stream, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much, Les. How are you? You good? Yeah, we're not too bad. Uh, uh, a little bit of squally weather up where I live, so not being able to get out and about much. How about you? Same here. And uh, Alison, who was doing moderating, she said it's absolutely bouncing it down uh, where she is. So everybody's uh, getting a little bit of it, aren't they? But yeah. No complaints. I've but been... I think we've got a little bit of sad news, haven't we? Yeah, Paul, to deliver to people. Yeah, we have. And I think a lot of people within subject and social media will already know that Derek Savory passed away uh, just a few days ago. And uh, yeah, terrible news. And for th there's a picture of Bob Brown there with white shirt on, Derek in middle and myself. Uh, one at conferences, an absolute diamond, a lovely guy, Derek was. And that's, they're not just kind words because of uh, Derek's passing, they're true. And it, it shows in social media because there's just a, an outpour of kind comments about how good this man was. Uh, he were kind enough to put myself and Steve Ashbridge up at his home probably 15 years ago when we went down to Rendlesham. And not just us. He'd got a he'd got an absolute flat full of people. Me and Steve slept in uh, in his back garden in a tent. <laughs> but Derek, the kind of man that you would say would just give you his last pound if he had it in his pocket. So really will be missed. And I'm, I met he came, he came to my home last year with Penny, his partner, and we spent a bit of time with him. And yeah, a terrible shock for everybody involved. So if you knew Derek, you know, full respect to the man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, and uh, let's have a look then. So Alison is doing the moderating uh, tonight. And uh, I think without further ado, Paul, I think we'll bring on uh, Paul A. Okay, okay. Bring him on. Bring him on. Here we go. <laughs> Hiya, Paul. Good to see you, my friend. And, Good evening, uh, guys. Nice to see you too. Yeah, it's superb. And uh, as I said, we had you on probably 18 months, two years ago now, at least. And uh, I know that everybody seemed to enjoy what you'd got to share with them then. So I'm I'm sure that it's going to be exactly the same today. So and, if. And, on, let's... Yeah, and um, I'll go, I'll disappear into the background. And if anybody has any questions for Paul as the show progresses, then fire them through to Alison and I'll see him on the screen. I'll see you okay, in a bit. Let's... Thanks a lot, Les. Yeah, so for those that don't know, with, with Paul Askoff, uh, writer, uh, what's the, the UFOs, The Real Story is the book, and it's available on Amazon. And uh, fabulous book full of all interesting accounts and UFO information. So author, researcher, and I would think more importantly, Paul, experiencer. Yeah, and that, that's what set me off down this road in the first time, in the first place, Paul. And I think for a lot of people, that's the hook that gets you in, you know, as you yourself know, as you experience things, whether it's paranormal, whether it's UFOs, cryptids, whatever, when something doesn't fit inside the normal box of what we experience on our, shall we say, normal daily lives, yeah. uh, it's like that's when you start searching for answers. How old were you then when when this when 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 the the unexplained kind of entered your life? Right. We just very briefly to explain. We just moved to the edge of a small village in on the West Yorkshire South Yorkshire border, and I was eleven years old. <laughs> Had no right. interest in science fiction or UFOs or anything like that, uh, and my father was strict he wasn't cruel or anything but like a lot of children in those days very i'm going back to 1968 so in fact my father was very victorian and you certainly did as you were told yeah and our yeah. last my brother and i our last job of the day was to take our dog for a walk and we had a disabled war veteran who lived next door and it was taking his dog for a walk as well so we lived right on the edge of the village and literally from the front of our home, you walked out into fields. Now, our home faced due east. We used to take the dogs for a walk, come back, put the dogs away, say goodnight to mum and dad, go to bed. That was the routine. Uh, my younger brother was nine at the time, about nine and a half, and I just had my 11th birthday. And dad was in the front garden. 
And mum said, go out, give your dad a kiss goodnight, like you always do. Uh, and there's, it was September, September 1968. Now, you have to think on, we were in a very rural location. So the night sky was much better than you can see now with all the white pollution. Plus, there wasn't the air traffic that there is now. And what happened was, the, my father, he'd, he'd got a telescope. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, my father was a bus driver, but he wasn't an astronomer or anything like that. But as an interest, he liked to involve his children. So it's just getting dark and the major constellations were just coming out. So he sat one at either side of him uh, and we're looking up at the sky. Now to the north, going directly away from us, is this thick bank of cloud which completely covered the north side of the sky. But to the south, it was completely clear and you could see. And as we're looking at the sky and my father's pointing up at the sky at these constellations, suddenly two UFOs came out of this bank of cloud really fast and then just stopped dead. There was no deceleration, no noise, no apparent rotation, and one was slightly to one side and slightly behind the other. They were a brilliant pearly white colour. Uh, and I would say from in, in, anybody in the UK, like a five pence piece at arm's length. They, yeah, so they were yeah. quite large. And the one that was nearest to the cloud, you could actually see the light from it shining on the surface of the cloud. Right. They were still for a few seconds. When they were still... I got a voice directly into my head and it said, oops, we haven't meant to have been seen. And I got that quite clearly. There was nothing else. Uh, there was still, and then immediately, keeping the same relative position to each other, they suddenly were moving very fast, going away from us. So like at 90 degrees from where they'd first come out the cloud. And as they moved away from us, there was like an atmosphere around them that sloughed off and left this tiny, tiny sort of teardrop shape at the back of them. So like something was coming off. They didn't change colour or anything, uh, but they just moved away from us. And as they moved down the bank of the cloud, as they got as the cloud gets closer and then further away, you could see the light shining from them uh, until they disappeared in the distance. And as you can imagine, the three of us were there looking yeah. at the sky, mouths agape. And uh, my father was the first to speak, and he'd done his national service with the RAF. And he just said, there's nothing that we have that can do that. And that was it. And I, I was hooked from then on. Because for me, it was, why don't I know about it? Why isn't it in the newspapers? Why isn't it on the television? You know, why aren't... It was so blatantly obvious and in view. Why aren't other people talking about it? And yeah. it was then on that I wanted to know, and it was like that was what got so, me into it. When when your dad's saying this, your father, uh, how how much did he speak about it afterwards to you? Well, that was it. I asked if my both my brother and my father. I asked if they had heard anything, and they both said no. And going to <laughs> the boy, yeah, a, a point that I can make later if you wish was how some people have this connection and it's all to do with frequencies and I believe that people do have or can have quite a close connection and because of the way that we'll say ET for want of a better phrase how ET works uh, they're able to capitalize on that and we're not even aware of it do, do you find it odd I mean because you'll have I, I think I can hear... Have you got the audio on playing back at us? Because I can hear that, your audio there, Paul. Or my I'm audio. Fine. Mine's fine at my end. I can hear Okay, no there. problem. I can hear somebody's... Yeah. I can hear myself, and I know I haven't got all else on. But, right, do you find it odd that when you heard the voice, uh, say, oops, we, we aren't supposed to be seen, I think is what you said. It's almost... It's, it's not what you'd expect some advanced civilization to say, although how would we know what they'd say? But over years, I've just kind of analysed what they said, and it's, it's did, did, do you think it yeah. was said in a childlike term, especially for you? No, 
I think no? it was okay. one of the things. One of the things that I always say, and this is true of uh, abduction scenario and ET in general. Any communication that we've had, there never seems to be a language problem, and it's because they speak telepathically. It's direct mind to mind, and it's it's only our language. It's us on a basic level that has to use language, and language uses speech where we can hide our thoughts, where ET, because they've nothing to hide, everything's in the open. So when you get that message directly into your head, uh, and there's other experiences the same, probably yourself, Philip Kinsella, lots of others, you get the intention, the feeling, you get everything with it. So there's no need to explain anything because you get the whole package in one go. Yeah, I, I I get what you're saying. Like you've said, that there's no language barrier. It crosses continents, but I, but it also seems to understand cultures as well and how to how to approach the individual. Because obviously, in some countries, we they would view the UFO totally different to how we would view it in 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 the West. In the uh, you know, so yeah. I just I, I just found it. I, obviously, that's what it said to you. But oops, it seems a weird thing. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Well, we can move on from that. If you imagine, if okay. I can just explain very briefly, the electromagnetic spectrum that we're on is our ordinary matter that we deal with on a daily basis or every day of our life. So at one end, we've got the long radio waves, which are weak and long radio waves. And then it comes up eventually through infrared until we get to our visible spectrum. And then it goes acoustic spectrum. The uh, next is our ultraviolet, and then X rays, and then gamma rays that are much shorter, high in energy at the other end. Now that's what our physics deal with. That's what we're aware of. Out of all that of our ordinary matter, the acoustic spectrum and visible spectrum that we see actually covers less than one tenth of one percent. So that's only a tiny fraction of what we see and hear of what's actually available but going on from that the cosmologists and astrophysicists and these scientists that are now looking into the universe and how everything works are all saying that dark energy and dark matter make up the vast majority of the universe some i can't i can't remember the figures off the top of my head but it's something like we'll say 65 percent is dark energy 30 odd percent dark matter and our bit that we deal with from the radio waves to the gamma rays is only like five percent of energy in the whole of the universe so there's all that out there that we've got literally no knowledge of as well really have we? yeah no nothing at all and this is what i say where well i'll, I'll use the term et but et is completely au fait with this they understand it they can manipulate it and that is why with going back to you, you were just commenting then on different cultures and different ways of communicating because they understand everything has a magnetic field. Our aura, we know when you meet somebody, whether you get on with them or not. We even say we were on the same wavelength. So we still yeah. use those phrases without realising what we're saying. But ET is able to understand that. Even your thoughts, your memories everything is an energy so et is able to get the whole picture of you from your electromagnetic spectrum and what you're giving out all the time and we're not aware of it uh but et is and because they can understand that that is why you don't have any cultural or communicative problems at all they just because they're getting the whole thing and, and and I note that you say ET. Do you believe these things are from space and they're not already here? Ah, now you see, if if you look historically, when people were talking about UFOs, even in recent times, it was always like flying saucers from outer space. But I think now, if you take into account the dark energy and dark matter, where we have, I always use the analogy of a, an LP, an old long playing record so if you imagine that our ordinary matter with our radio waves to gamma rays and our little bit that we see in here in the middle that is 
that is one LP, that is just one LP. But there's a whole stack of LPs with this dark energy and dark matter around us all the time. So I'm pretty certain, uh, in my opinion at the moment, I'm like, well, it's a, I'm a Yorkshireman, so I think I'm right. But <laughs> until, I, until I'm proved wrong, this is, and I have to say, over time, we seem to be getting more and more corroborative evidence that this is how things are being explained. This is how, this is why we see and experience what we do. And it's because of this other energy that's around us all the time, that ET is around us all the time. And it's the same with going on to the paranormal and the cryptids. They're just on a different record. It's a different vibration, a different frequency, a parallel universe, whatever you want to call it. But they all exist at the same time. But because ET understands it and can manipulate it and control it, that is why we experience what we do and why we don't know they're there. And they could be literally just right next to us and we wouldn't know because they're on a different level altogether. Do, do, you, do you think then, if we look at it as a whole, all of the different genres of the phenomena that are interacting or coming through, do you think they're all employing the same type of science if that's the word for it or is it just the location that is like a thin area where these things are able to manifest more frequently oh well that's two good questions there <laughs> yeah well right, do, do a moment of time it's all good <laughs> yeah first of all as you're aware benton and skinwalker ranch the alaska triangle you know there's all these other areas, and I, I believe there's thousands of them. I don't particularly yeah. believe that they're triangular, but that is just, I think, because I think they will be influenced by the Earth's magnetic field and where they are at the time. So I do believe that these areas of high strangeness will come and go and vary in strength and shape as well. However, if you imagine lower energies like cryptids, like uh, the spirit worlds and elements and all this type of thing. I mean, Jacques Vallée in his old book, like Passport to Magonia, touched on this. I mean, with him, it was like uh, explaining fairy folk and these other things, yeah. old folklore. And we've all, <coughs> across, across the world, we've all got all these. And it's just a way of, we couldn't understand how different dimensions existed. Now this is coming more to the fore and it's becoming more accepted. It then begins to explain what they couldn't explain before and why we experience what we do with dogman, with cryptids, with the paranormal, with poltergeist phenomenon. And I think these are on relatively low down in the stack of records and lower vibration where ET can be from a much higher vibration. Um, one of the things that uh, Bud Hopkins uh, that was very fortunate to meet. But Hopkins, Dolores Cannon in a time, more recently, Kat Marden, and there are many others as well, uh, John Mack. But they often say that with experiences and these other people, that they lower the frequency to be able to contact us. And I think right. that's a good way of explaining it, how they go from, they might be, five, six, ten records above us in the stack of records, but because they can understand it and control it, they can come down. And that is why we see as little as we do, because although yeah. they're there, they're not on our frequency. They're not within our visible spectrum. Okay. So there are these geographical areas all over. And <laughs> going back to the investigations that you do, which is just wonderful, but I do worry that very often we can't control this. And I think no. this is true of the paranormal, cryptids and UFOs, that uh, you can enter this bubble of a different different dimension. You enter, Once you get into that bubble, and how many times they were here, suddenly I couldn't hear anything. There was no wind mm. in the trees. There was no background. There were no birds. There were no nothing absolute silence and that's because you've moved into a different frequency so you've moved out you've moved out of our acoustic spectrum so you can't hear anything 
so then, Paul, is it is it the that that faction of the phenomena in um, forcing its its existence onto us, or what? How does the frequency, in your opinion, change into our in our environment? It's got to be the, that phenomena that's forcing the change. Surely, I'll yeah. just elaborate. In Wolflands, we talked to a guy who was on the cliff tops at Scalby Mills. Les remembers this well. And he, yeah. perfect example, he talked about everything. He couldn't even hear the sea. So we know that yeah. surely it's not got the phenomena to stop the sea, but it's it's altered the environment. It's altered the yeah. environment around it. So is that is that is that the science that's been employed, or or how is that working in your opinion? Right. In my opinion, that's a natural thing that happens between the different vibrations, and you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or now, right place at the wrong time. Yeah, at the right place. Now, you see, this is a lot of things. Yeah, you're good there, yeah. Now, one of the things that I always say is, we'll just touch on cryptids, paranormal. All, they all can happen in the same place, like Skinwalker Ranch, like Bempton. And UFOs, because they're able to understand that, it's like an energy shortcut for yeah. them. So that's why all these locations all report UFOs. And it's mm. because UFOs are aware of it, they understand. To them, I hate to use the phrase wormhole because I don't think there's... It's a highway, isn't it? It's a, yeah, it's a, yeah, you've got it, yeah, yeah. But for them, it's a shortcut to get from one energy to or one dimension to another using less energy. And that's why you see these, you get flashes in the sky. When we were with you in Bempton, uh, when Chris Evers was interviewing you, I don't know if you can recall it, but he was talking away, and on several occasions, there were flashes in the sky. Now, it's easy to, to be misled, and when you're on your own, obviously, you, you can't, there's no substantiating thing. But when there's half a dozen people all seeing a flash in the same time, then yeah. obviously, there's something to it. And I think it's just as you zip through the frequencies, and as they pass through our visible spectrum, that's when we see the flash. Yeah, and and you, you make a great point there because we we act, we do see these flashes of light very often up there, and yeah. yes, food for thought there, Paul. And yes, yeah. so, so what do you think the are they just are they just tourists? What do you think they gain from entering our sphere of existence? I know it's all hypothetical. I know it's all we just we just sort of Paul's that Paul's theory on what it is, people in chat's theory on what it is, and that I don't think there's a right answer. But what, what do yeah, you think? I agree. Yeah. It's I, I, one of the things I always say. I'm not an expert. There's no experts in this field, but it's good that we can all talk and put our ideas ideas into a pot that help everybody come up with new ideas and new thoughts, and it helps everybody move forward. And I think ET just use that because they're completely in control of the whole of the dark energy, the dark matter, as well as our ordinary matter, it just comes into it. And it's just something else, I know I'm moving forwards, but something else yeah, which I believe is ET have a non-interference policy, if you like. So if we, we they leave us to do what we have to do and even though they're around us they don't allow they're a, right i'll give you throw something else at you <laughs> see what you think about this one going back to the stack of lps right yeah yeah if you imagine purity god whatever you want to call it uh is the hole in the center i don't believe there's such a person as god like I don't believe there's such a thing as the devil. There's no such thing as heaven. There's no such thing as hell. These were man-made constructs to help people and make money, as it was at the time. But purity, it's the way that you, what can I say, the way that you conduct yourself now, your ethics, your morals, the way you help people, the way you don't do things for profit, you do things for other people as well and it's those sort of things that help you move forward and that you're a nice person that you're a good person now by doing this you'll go back to that lp the old vinyl record 
all those grooves, if you imagine they're separate grooves, they're all lessons in your plan, in your life, if you like. So it's by your own effort that you move towards the hole in the centre and not do the wrong thing and move back out towards evil on the outside. Now, there is such a thing as evil and there is such a thing as powerful demons and that sort of thing, but good will always overcome it. Good will always win because it's a higher frequency, it's a more powerful frequency and the light will always overcome the dark. Now, I know I've thrown a lot of things no. out there. Then. So so but, basically, our intention, our intention, any individual, uh, directs us to where we'll end up in the future or throughout life. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I think this is something that ET is bound by as well. Uh, and it's they, I'm not saying they're all the same, because I do believe there are different ETs, same as there are mammals on this planet, that are different ETs around the universe. It's like I can't believe that out of the trillions and trillions of solar systems that we see, each star that we see, at some point, the planets that are out surround it will have a planet that will be within the, the Goldilocks zone and able to support sentient and intelligent life so some of these quite naturally will be tens of thousands of years in front of us so there's no wonder that we don't understand what's going on just look at how far we've come in the last 100 200 years you know but but it, paul if there's a code uh, that that kind of forbids these other intelligences i don't know interfering too much with us how do we explain alien abduction and 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 hum we'll say animal and human fatalities we'll use that word how do we explain yeah. that and, and and when people blame these other intelligences these unknown others on it yeah i mean i can quite oh yeah i can only go from personal experience and yeah. people that i've spoken to and whatever but i personally do believe that there are good and bad et and the obviously good ones it's like the calvin parker thing when he said the last thing he can remember was they said we meant you no harm you know and there's a lot of that that comes from uh again bud hopkins dolores cannon Cathmard, and john Mac and they all say the same thing where whatever uh culture or background or country these people come from they were all saying the same thing and bud hopkins and i'll never forget it and i was having lunch with him i was very fortunate and the sentence he said was paul the only thing that all these people had in common was me he said they would never meet each other he says they would never know each other he said but when they're all telling me exactly the same thing you've got to think he says it makes me hairs on the back of your neck stand up and it was like no, yes, I have heard all this before, but there's obviously something going on that we're not being allowed to remember. Yeah. Uh, and I think in some ways, is it a bizarre act of kindness by E.T. that we do have that missing time and that missing memory or, you know, screen memories that make it more acceptable so that people can put a line under it and move, move on with their lives? Yeah, well, Bud Hopkins. Then you met Bud Hopkins during the his time regressing. Individuals who claim to have had contact with ET. Did he did he find some true horror stories amongst it, or was it what mainly good experiences that were being reported, or a mixture across the board? If if I not, was, if well, I'm just saying, I think it was a mixture across the board, but I wouldn't say horror stories. Uh, particularly that people were damaged. I mean, it's like, we'll, we'll just take Calvin Parker as an example. He was very traumatised at the time. Uh, um, but fortunately, he sort of had a PTSD from it almost, but managed to carry on with his life to the extent that as he got more mature and he, he could accept it, uh, when Cap Marden uh, did hypnotic, regressive hypnotherapy with him following that he'd actually been abducted on four occasions but he could only naturally remember the one and that is why i think sometimes 
there's this again like i've just said this bizarre act of kindness where et substitute screen memories or no memories at all the yeah. uh, i did a, an investigation for Buford back in 1995 where four adults were abducted and they were a husband and wife and the wife could remember nothing from the actual abduction but the husband uh, he said, Paul, it was like, I mean, a very graphic description. He said, it was like my memories, if you can imagine it being like an old VHS tape. He says, but the tapes have been taken out and pieces are missing and all the bits have been put back in the wrong order. And he said, I can't remember it properly. He says, how you can, people can jog your memory, you do remember things and you can go back. And he says, that's not happening for me. He says, I can remember it was, it was a, a sunny evening, middle of July, nice warm weather, sat having a barbecue in the garden and he was having a drink. And he said, I can remember putting my drink down and then all of a sudden it was dark. And he said, I can actually remember thinking, why is it dark so quick, you know? And then and he can't stopped. remember anything after that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah you know, I, when I wrote Night People, I, I, I made a point of telling people, you're not going to read a book that's got a a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's, they're just cameos of events because I can't remember. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't really remember a start in many many of these instances. And there's a brilliant researcher who I'd love to get on. I know he's not well at the moment, but I do know him very well, called Derek Tyler. I don't know if you've come across Derek. He's, he's an American, and he, he wrote two books, and one of them is, is called Alien Contact, The Difficult Truth. And when I spoke to Derek about these things, he, he said, you, you know, he said he wouldn't advise re hypnotic regression because the memories that you've got are probably all, all that you need to remember. Yeah, yeah, they're protecting you. So it echoes what you're saying there, Paul, you know, in, in a lot of ways. So, yeah, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And so, I think, if, it's cool. if, I, if I just, just a little bit. No, for, take as long as you like. Take as long as you like. If, if you think. Uh, if, if we were looking at a population, we'll, we'll just use birds in, in a certain area and you're looking at their nature when you're in a nature reserve and we often look at ring birds, we'll put big nets up, we'll get the birds, we'll see how many there are, whether they're a good weight and we so that we know how big the population is, if they're healthy and all that sort of thing. Could they, in a bizarre way, could they be doing the same sort of thing with us? And we don't remember because it would be traumatic for us, you know. So mm. it's a way of them keeping an eye on us without, you know, and be able to keep us at arm's length so that we can function as normal, for want of a better term. And, and do, do, you, do you believe then that they, they're, they're one, two steps in front of everything we could think, everything we can per perceive? Oh, yeah. well, I, basically you do, because I know from the earlier part of this talk, that's as good as what you were saying. And... Yeah. Uh, so well, think about it logically, Paul, just like you've just said there, how your brain works, how we function and we question things and we formulate questions and all the rest of it. They can see all that. They pick up on that all immediately. Every thought you have is an energy. So they know it's there. So mm. you, there's no getting away from it. Whatever you think, they know. S and so so all them. When people talk about disclosure, you know, we don't have, we can go as deep or as light as you want with disclosure, but when people talk about it, if they, if these other intelligences don't want us to know, we're, we're basically we're never going to find out anyway. We're never going to advance any further with the knowledge. We might be going in uh, what we consider a, a better direction on understanding what's happening, but actually understanding what e exists behind the firewall we're never going to find out because if, if what you're saying is correct and they know our intention, they know what we're thinking and our our end game as regards yeah. exposing what yeah. they are, it's not going to happen, is it? Then if, if we live in Paul Ascoff's world, and I'm not saying that's a bad place, I'm just saying it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I just think, I'm going back to disclosure with that, uh, and bless him, Chris Evers is doing the Outer Limits magazine uh, annual conference on the 14th of September with disclosure yep. as it. Yes, I'm speaking there as well. Just speaking, yeah. One of the things that I think, if you can imagine, uh, well, if you remember a few years ago, uh, is it three years ago, just about now, nearly, 
they released the Go Fast Gimbal and Tic Tac UFO videos, right? Yeah. Now, they did the ATIP report, and I was asked to, with among many others, to go down and talk about it. And one of the things which was came to light for me from the report was that it, they were good sightings, and yes, they got them what they released on the infra, in the infrared spectrum on the gun cameras. They were also seen within our normal visible spectrum by the pilots. So you'd got trained observers in the visible spectrum. You'd got the infrared gun cameras on the Super Hornets recording it in infrared. And they were also recorded on the radar of the carrier fleet underneath. So that was the Theodore Roosevelt and the Nimitz, with the two aircraft carriers. But the thing that seemed to be brushed over, they actually had 80. So they've got another 77 of these instances where they've got videos, yeah. but they, they won't release it when they've been asked about it previously. They won't release it because it's in the interest of national security. So right. they release that. And I think what's happening disclosure wise is We'll never find out the truth about Roswell. We'll never find out about the truth about Rendlesham Forest, even the Pentridge incident and all these others, because they would they would have to admit that they've been complicit in the cover-up. However, because of modern technology and the internet as we're using now, because people could video things and then immediately put them on YouTube, put them out on all these different media platforms, they can't keep a lid on it anymore. So I believe we're getting this drip feed, this soft disclosure, if you like. Which will prolong the agony. Well, just yeah. it'll just extend it and keep kicking the ball further down the field. That's what they're doing. Yeah. And if, if you mm. think about it logically as well, the other <laughs> psychological operation, for want of a better term, you're getting all the films of, UFOs. I mean, how many documentaries are on now about UFOs where you never used to get any before? And then the other thing is uh, they make these big budget films like Paul. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Our name's it. But it's introducing that psychologically to the general public so mm -hmm. that the general public, where previously you would have put a small grey in a UFO and everybody would have freaked out. Now people just go, oh yeah, so you were, oh it's a good, yeah, 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 we know about that. And what it's doing is instilling this normality within, within the general public. And yeah. I think so that if it does come to a crux and a point like that, it's more easily accepted and they won't get the panic because at the end of the day, from like, I believe it was from like the Washington DC in the early 50s, 52 or thereabouts, that they really clamped down aggressively and covered it up and put a lid on it. Uh, and I think because of that, they've covered up so much, they, they're having to release it slowly. Uh, but, I mean, if you think about it at the time, it was the early 50s. It was only just after the Second World War. There was still a lot of cold conflict. We'd still got the uh, Cold War that was heating up then. And so you had this cover up and a lid on everything tight, very aggressive to keep it out and everybody was ridiculed and it was to keep it out of the public eye so that they didn't have to admit that yes we have no control over our airspace and these things are coming and going as they please and we can't do anything about it. So people didn't panic then because they thought it was rubbish for want of a better word. Yeah. So, so you don't think there's any chance of these other intelligences giving technology to another country on, on, on Earth and aiding them to the demise of other people? To the, do, yeah. uh, you know, so they're not yeah. that bad intention. Do you think they're just observers? Yes. I think that's a very good point you came up with there because we're constantly hearing the stories of uh, people that have been into space, people that have uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans even the British, that have back-engineered all this technology and they've got these TR3Bs and all the rest of it. If they had that, I mean, if you think about it logically, even now, why wouldn't they use them? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right, if they had them, why don't they just take over the world? Because nobody else can do anything about it. Do you know, I've, I've said that loads of times and you've just echoed it in a roundabout way. You know, when we talk about the triangles that people see in 1990s and, and you know, you know, uh, John Hansen, brilliant archive. And he's got reports of the triangles from 1901. If, yeah. if, if mankind had this kind of technology, why isn't it being used? And yeah. I'm not saying that they haven't, but, you know, I just can't understand why it's not being employed. If you've got something, as people describe, and not just one witness, as multiple witnesses, time and time again, describe these things in some instances as being as big as a football field, to yeah. totally silent, that can move at walking pace and then zip away at what, what you would call something like warp speed, for want of a better word, then why yeah. aren't we using this technology if we've got it? I mean, somebody yeah. in chat might have a theory on that and a, or an answer. You know, I, I really don't know. And questions, please, in capitals for, for Paul uh, when we get round to that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what your views are on that, if any. If, but I, I briefly also wanted to ask you about your brother when he saw the objects with you. What has, Have you spoke to him about it over years or has he dismissed yeah. it? No, he's he, he believes it, really believes it was there, but... It didn't hook him. He wasn't that interested. It was a UFO, yeah, sorry. Now, my father was slightly more interested because when he went out and bought uh, Eric von Daniken's Chariots of Chariots. the Gods. Yeah. So that was that was one of the first. It was great because my dad would get these books in. And as I'm sure we've had this conversation before, but back in the late 60s and early 70s, there were no internet, there were no, there weren't even a, your local library didn't have a book on UFOs or whatever. No. So you really have to get on local transport and get off into the big cities and order these books. So, so, it, was, so it was different then. Go on, sorry. So, no, no, no. So you're not trying to say that you're somehow special, but you heard the voice. Yeah, but all three of you saw it saw the object, but you heard the voice. You're the one then that's followed this path. So do you think that sighting was for you or do you just think it was a chance sighting? I th In some ways, I think it was for me. Now, I've had this conversation with uh, Philip Kinsella. <laughs> and Philip, one of the things that I've um, had a conversation with him was the difference between... Uh, out of the body experiences and UFO experiences and I think you get this commonality again between cryptids the paranormal and UFOs where if you enter this the bubble people get this terror which you don't get with out of the body experiences and it's because I believe I could be wrong again that it's your soul your higher self entering a wrong frequency entering the wrong vibration entering the wrong you know universe if you like and because it knows it's in the wrong place suddenly and you can't help it it's a natural thing and i think it must be some sort of survival thing uh and philip even though he narrates his story and his abduction so eloquently uh, he was terrified and he said mm. I, I was absolutely you know and he said, you can't switch it off. That's how it is. And I think it's a natural inbuilt mechanism that we have. That that's where we shouldn't be to encourage you to back off and come out of it. Uh, so I do, think it's true, whether it's paranormal cryptids or UFOs. And, and so, so when we talk about the alien abduction or the abduction scenario then, and people talk about passing through walls, do you think in some instances... That could be the essence of the soul that's been transported, or do you think we're doing that, and it, th these these beings aren't in control of what makes us makes us cry, makes us laugh, makes us have all these emotions that we can't sort of look on an X-ray or cut us open and find any of that. It's just there. Is that the soul? Right. Yeah. And I think there's you've hit on a good point there as well. I think in certain cases you get both sides of the coin because ET understands the whole of the magnetic spectrum it understands where we're resonating at therefore you can get people that will be physically abducted because 
they can change where they are. Now, I'm, I'm just going to digress slightly a bit. If I go off on a tangent, bring me back to it. Yeah, do it. But, I like tangents. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but one of the things, going back to Bud Hopkins, Dolores Cannon, John Mark, Kath Marden, all of them, they all say when they talk to the abductees, everything is done direct mind to mind. It all goes, there's no speech. It's all directly. So you get everything behind it. Now, because it's like that, the uh, on the abduction scenario, it's everything is done on frequencies. Everything is energy. So because ET <coughs> understands the frequency of that, they can communicate or not let you remember what, whatever. But also, they can move the physical body out of tune it to where they want to be. So you can get that where you get a physical abduction or because they're able to control it they can just take your higher self and take the soul so you get the it's not a body out of body experience but i'm just going to use that phrase as a an easy way to explain it so they can take the spirit or they can take the physical and i think to et don't i don't ask me why because i don't know but i think it's whatever's you know good for them at the time that's whatever what purpose doing. they they need yeah yeah yeah, and again, that's why there's no barriers. That's why you get people that will just, people that have witnessed the partners just disappear or people have floated out through walls, through doors, through ceilings because they're on a different frequency. So that in there, it's not a physical barrier anymore because they're not on that frequency. They're not on that record. They're not on that LP. So, so what about, and this is jumping away from it slightly, but what about when you've got a multi-witness sighting or, 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 or multiple people there but only one person can see it or there's three people and they all see it slightly different once again yeah. no wrong right or wrong answer what do you think's happening there are, are we right. getting fed information on an individual basis are, are, they, are they that clever or is it just our perception yeah. that's yeah both of those right. right if you think about it everybody is different we're all on different learning curves we're all at different frequencies and that's why again going back to the old adage when you meet somebody you know if you're going to get on with them you know if they're on the same wavelength and that's exactly how it works so you can get people there's a good analogy which i use in my book actually was uh, an old friend of mine who uh, was part of a paranormal investigative group and one this, they went to an old, I can't remember, like an airfield or something. One of them just felt something. He felt cold, sort of a shimmer, but didn't actually, something out the corner of his eye, but didn't actually see, physically see anything. Another one saw an old person, but nothing identifying. And somebody else, now, anyway, I'll carry on. Somebody else saw an old airman in uniform and everything, like from the Second World War. And when they got back, they were one of these groups, they didn't communicate while they were there. What they did was they used to split up around a location and they used to have notepads and they all used to write times down on what they experienced. So then they'd all get back together and they'd say, right, uh, let's just say 12.40, I experienced this. And the other one said, well, at 12.40, I got, but it was that. So by by sort of the sort of what can I say a generalization of what they all experienced it was a second world war airman that was frequenting his ghost was still around the place and that was uh, that was the accepted thing of what what they'd experienced but somebody saw it in its entirety and somebody didn't see anything at all so because everybody's on a different frequency that is why people experience things differently. And I think to some extent, that is why abductees uh, have different experiences as well. Even sightings, you get people that will see things that other people don't, you know. Yeah. And so do you think then after, after a sighting, after an experience, one or the other, be it cryptid, be it spirit, do you think that you're more likely to experience again because you you actually you're not believing anymore you know but does that does that help open things up <laughs> that's a good question because i can't honestly say yes or no to that answer 
I don't know. But having said that, I think people uh, do experience things uh, depending on how they personally are. And I don't think it means that they're specifically more advanced than anybody else. They're just tuned at that time. And the, I've seen dozens of UFOs. That uh, again, I can say I know it was a UFO. I know it was something unexplained. Often I've had witnesses. On one uh, occasion, there were 13 saw it. Uh, and that was outside my home, just south of Leeds, you know. So it's not just seeing something personally, but often it depends on the actual uh, event itself on whether it's meant for somebody specifically or whether it's just as a byproduct of what work, whatever they're doing at the time, if yeah. that makes sense. It does, and, and this might make sense or it might not but you, you know when after after somebody's had a bereavement uh the person close to the bere you know the, the departed often they're thinking about them aren't they and they're concentrating on them they've got fond memories for the we would hope anyway and we, we hear lots of times that they'll then they'll report seeing this person or, or is appeared to them, or she's appeared to them. It, you know, not always at the foot of the bed, but you know, we would choose that scenario. Whereas, it, in in normal life, these people might not necessarily say that they've ever seen what we would say is a ghost or a spirit ever. Yeah. So that's a, that's been tuned in. That, that surely, in a way, to what you're talking about, they've, they've altered yeah. their kind of mindset. I would have said, but you're saying frequency. Yeah, if, if you imagine that uh, you're with somebody for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and you can be close living together for that long, so you're going to have that person's frequency imprinted on you when you work together as a team. And it's that's what sort of relationships are about. But sometimes when they're broken, at the right time and in the right circumstances, if... I hate to say this, but if if spirit were of a mind to make you aware that they're all right, that sort of thing, and you're of the, in the just in the right frame of mind to accept it, the frequency can be just right that you can see something like that. And the same happened to uh, Philip Kinsella when a friend that had died that he knew, and he said, and it was just like it's not that it was anything scary or he appeared through a wall or whatever. It was just stood in the garden looking at him. Uh, yeah. And he said it was just there like normal, like large as life, you know. So so, so is that, is that the, obviously we, we don't know, do we? But is that the spirit of that person or is that some higher energy, some higher intelligence showing us that then? Uh, right. you know, loads of these right. are open-ended. There isn't a right or a wrong <laughs> answer, is there? Well, one of the things that I think is you can get, what I call a true ghost, which is an imprint on something. Say you, you where you live now, Paul. You've lived there for quite a few years. I've lived in my house for 27 years now. Yeah. If I if I lived another 27 years, I, that's 50 odd years that my energy has been printed on the fabric of that building. So yeah. in the right circumstances, in another 50 years time, somebody might just be in the right frame of mind at the right frequency that it picks up my frequency now think on a lot of the times when this happens is in the quiet hours of the morning you know it's dark it's two o'clock in the yeah. morning whatever but if you think about it logically again going back to the frequencies and the energy and everything else we are normal diurnal beings we wind down at night and we go to sleep so our energy is less we relax more, we're less thinking, we're, ready for, we're getting ready for sleep. So you have these, what the science calls the hypnopompic and hypnagogic bits where you're either just falling asleep or you're just waking up. But also you're more relaxed and you're more open to the other frequencies that are around you. The other thing at the same time that happens is industry as a whole and everybody else, including a lot of the animals, everything else is going to bed and quiet yeah. down so it makes the 
the playing field, if you like, much more level and much more open to these sort of things. So you're more likely to experience something in the early hours of the morning because of these. And again, it's just less interference and less magnetic energy that you're being bombarded with. That's great. That absolutely great answer. And if if it is an answer, <laughs> I didn't mean that. no, no sarcasm meant there. It's just it, it, yeah. I'd not thought of it like that before, Paul. And that's great. Yeah. And uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to bring Les in in a moment to see if we've uh, see if Alison's uh, threaded any questions through from chat. And uh, are you okay for some questions? So sure, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And that to do all. It's been great. So, Les, can we see if there's any questions, please? And uh, there you go, Les. Yeah. Yes, and uh, a great show so far, guys. And uh, thanks for coming on as a guest tonight, Paul. And uh, Alison has sent some great questions through and very, very knowledgeable uh, people in the chat, Paul, uh, on the True Proof live stream, I've got to say. And uh, so the first question is from Alex... Uh, Thompson, and the question is this I don't even read that on the screen but, uh, Paul, but I'll read it out Evening Paul, is there a subject in ufology stroke paranormal you're now looking more into that you may have disregarded previously Right, uh, so you've no sound there then Paul Can you? Right, okay What's okay. happened, is my is my ask not muted, that's strange No, the audio has gone down yeah, audio's um, gone down. Can you, you well, take it? You can't hear us. Do you want to go out and back in? Yeah, okay, we'll try that again, people. And uh, while Paul's doing that, we'll just read a few names out that's in the chat where I can see. And uh, yeah. as we normally do that <clears throat> earlier, and we've got Joey Hayes, Third Fish, Chris James. And I see Chris has said, so I'll say that he wants to contact Paul Askoff. Uh, after the chat or at some point so we'll see if we can get that sorted chris vincent tomlinson uh enigma i nearly said enema i'm so <laughs> just <looking. laughs> uh, just, just sorry um joey hayes we've done that and i can only see uh, i know lynn is in i think pete will be listening stargazer welsh dragon rising uh danny appleby uh yeah and there's going to be a load more people that i've missed oh, uh, uh, and yeah. Sally, Sally Etherington, great to see you. And oh, good. Yeah, it's just uh, this guy's interesting. So I hope we do get his audio back. And Laura's in, my daughter. Hi, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Andy Decodes. And yeah, oh, that's brilliant. And uh, hopefully, Paul will be back shortly. Yeah. Just Otherwise, to, you'll uh, be left with me. Uh, left Sam and me. Riley. So, me yeah, Paul, so yeah. any questions? And uh, let's just. Uh, Fire them back at Paul, visit Bridget Vanden Bosch. There's a, a name to say when you've had a few beers. And uh, well, when Paul comes back on, I do have a few questions here, so we'll be able to kick off. Yeah, okay. um, it looks like he's on the stage of joining us. At the stage. Um, okay, Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. We're back on. I don't know what happened, but as soon as Les appeared, I just went silent. Couldn't hear anything. No, well, I, I have that effect on people, I think, uh, Paul. <laughs> so, uh, right then, uh, so we'll go back to the question you can probably see then. Uh, yeah. Is there a subject in ufology paranormal you're now looking more into that you may have disregarded previously? I, I think that's a good question. And I think it's made me go more where, where i was always on the ufo side of things i've now gone uh where cryptids and uh paranormal and everything's more connected than i ever thought it was and i think over time i've realized that it's the same sort of mechanism for all these things and they're all connected and it's just as time's gone on it's in going back and re-evaluating the paranormal and cryptid experiences and trying to correlate things and put things together within the UFO bubble. And it's not just UFOs. It is everything's all together, if that makes sense. Right. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. 1423, yeah. Great to meet you at the awakening, Paul, and thanks for your time. 
Why do you think the ETs are here? And are we just coincident coincident coincidental to them? Coincidental, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, another good yeah. question. Yeah. Uh but <laughs> it's, this is going down going down the rabbit hole further. I think that we were created by ET way, way back in time. And they have to leave us to get on to develop ourselves. And I think this is one of the things that's happening now in the world where we have to realize our potential and our spirit, spiritual side of things. Now, I don't mean that in a religious context at all. I think it's just a way of the human psyche, if you like, being more aware of all this that's going on around us and improving ourselves. And I think that until we can do that and we can honestly have conversations with each other uh, and move forward instead of thinking what can I get out of this and what can I get out of that and it's that mindset that's got to go and it's us as a whole that have got to move forward so I don't think we're just coincidental at all I think this as a human race we have to advance and I think that's becoming more obvious where you're now getting this what can i say the two sides of the coin where the corruption in governments are being made more aware of people are now aware of it where we never were and you're getting that evil side of things and the profit and the money laundering and all the rest of it where normal people are trying to do the best for each other and move forward in their own lives uh, and I think it's something that ET, as I said earlier, won't, in, won't involve themselves with because we have to do it by our own efforts. It's what you do now and how you conduct yourself now that you move forward. And I think the sooner we realise that, uh, and it's not that the world's becoming more evil or whatever, but it's be we're becoming more aware of it. So more of it is being exposed and that's why things are happening that are happening now. Thank you. That's a good answer. And um, uh, just an observation from me, and probably 99.9% .9 of people on the stream, is that <coughs> we'll be heading into into stranger times, uh, possibly wars, uh, Paul. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. I mean, when you think about it, why all the money that's thrown at wars and all the rest of it, and it's billions and billions, why can't they just have a ceasefire and say okay let's just see what's wrong with society as a whole and put the money into that and it's really everything's back to front and it's all they've got it all wrong and it's when we cross that bridge it's like there was a, a good old saying that's when uh the power of love overcomes the love of power then we can move forward and do you, do you see that happening anytime soon paul that's a yeah that's, that's, a, that's the answer <laughs> yeah, I would love to say yes. I would love nothing yeah. more. But uh, I think it's a, a slow awakening of the masses. And I think it's it'll a, take it... It's an awakening of the masses. Unfortunately, though, the people who wield the power... Uh, no matter how awake we get, we'll, we'll so, I don't know, not put blinkers on us, but they'll put the brakes on us uh, unless yeah. there's some kind of revolution. But it would have to be a world revolution. You know? yeah. Is that going to happen? <clears throat> I don't know. I would, look, I would love to say yes, but I don't yeah, yeah. know. <laughs> okay, okay, let's... Then, yeah, yeah, moving off on a different tack. Uh, so, look, uh, Pendle Hill UFOs. Question... Uh, do crossing ley lines equal a nexus slash crossing slash portal? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> In a word, absolutely. <laughs> because I, I, I think everything's to do with frequencies. Everything's to do with magnetic fields and how things react with each other and interact with each other. And as Paul and I mentioned earlier, you have these geographical areas that have a... <clears throat> Sometimes it's a lesser energy, sometimes it's a stronger energy. And that's when you get all these things happening. And I think ley lines and all these portals, they call them, Skinwalker Ranch, Bempton, they're all portals. 
it's the, it, the different labels, but it means the same thing. And it's just where the two records, if you like, are touching. And mm. sometimes it's stronger energy than others. So sometimes that's when you get these things happening. That's when you see the cryptids. That's when you see the UFOs. That's when you get a lot more poltergeist activity and other paranormal stuff. But uh, I think they go in ways like that. And, and do you think they're knowingly slipping through some of these things, or is it just th there's this there's this thin air here at that particular time, and these these intelligences, these unknown others, just take advantage and make an appearance? And why don't they? And, and could they be trapped here until such times as I don't know? <clears throat> I'm, yeah. I'm asking lots of questions that, that don't have a don't have a yes or a no answer, really, aren't I? Yeah, I agree. Now, my personal opinion is that a lot of the lower energies, like we'll just go on with cryptids and poltergeist phenomena and other paranormal phenomena, the lower energies, and that is why they don't have any control over it except for when it's strong and they're in that bit. As you, uh, when you were with Andy Ramsden that time, uh, that was a strong way you saw something jump up the cliff. Clear uh, the fence, yeah. And then you could see the eyes. Uh, mm. And Andy was scared to death, and I love him telling the story. It makes me laugh every time. But uh, I don't think they can control it. I think they use it, but they can't control it. Where ET, I don't think they can control it, in my opinion, but they're aware of it, and they can use it. They know It's, it's like us being aware of the tides. We know when it's safe to, to come in and out kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's I've got a question from Sally Etherington. Um, this is a great story. But yeah, go on, Les. I don't know. Okay. That. Hi, could this be what Tim and I experienced at Bempson, the glass tunnel experience? So for anybody who's unfamiliar, uh, Paul Sinclair, if you could just give a brief... Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I will do. And then, then yeah. Paul can give his opinion. Well, uh, I... <laughs> I, well, last year, and Sally and her husband visited the cliff tops, not for any anything to do with the unexplained, just to take in the scenery, the seabirds, and they they entered one area or walked into one area of the cliff tops where they both became aware that everything had stopped. The sound of the seabirds, the sound of the sea, the wind, everything, just like was not frightening. I, I, I spoke to Sally, and it, I don't think it was frightening. It was just whoa what's happening here turned to her husband said have you noticed this i don't know what her exact words were now to be honest with you and he said yeah and they walked through it and out the other side and then walked back and it had gone uh so, so fascinating i mean you'd actually been past that spot when you were visited but it's not that I, and now i wonder if these places are transient i wonder if they move or i wonder if that's a, a key location yeah so i I've got the story what, what are your view yeah now, I, I think I've been very fortunate that they've experienced, they're lucky to experience that. Um, <clears throat> in my opinion, again, it's, this is maybe, I don't know, a week uh, and on the edge of the area. There's a good instance like this of a guy in uh, a light aircraft on the Bermuda Triangle that was projected forward. I don't know if you remember this story. And it felt like he was going through a tunnel in the cloud. And he actually right. landed in Miami sort of 40 minutes before his plane could even, you know, he wouldn't even fly that fast. But he, he, but he survived it and went through it. And I think we do get these anomalies where on the edges of this bubble, if you will just call it that as an idea, these move <coughs> all the time and they vary in frequency all the time. Unfortunately, sometimes you get people like that where they... Uh, this couple just were on the edge of it. They were able to experience some of it, but they didn't get the difference in loss of time. They didn't get transported anywhere else. Didn't get the Magoni a bit. And this is what I often worry about with you, Mister Sinclair. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew what you, I knew you were going to say that because it, we. I'm always careful when we talk about the missing people, but. And, but we've seen this strange anomaly, this strange bubble of 
of, of lights on the cliff tops that people have reported, and I've I've said so. People must get what I'm get get what I'm getting at when I say it. And I often say, yeah. I wonder what would happen if they walked through that, and, and we might never see them again. Basically, yeah. you know. Yes, yeah. I think you could be right because it's as, as we're going back to this bubble again. You're literally walking from one record onto another, and that is part of I believe could be part of the explanation of missing people and missing vehicles, whatever, all sorts of things over yeah. the years. And, and that is why we get a lot of the folklore from these old cultures. I mean, the fairy folk in Ireland and little people and all the rest of it. And I think it's just a way of, that's how it's people have explained it over, over time. And now in modern times, we be, we sort of, getting a handle on it if you like and realizing yeah. this is what's real this is the reality of what's happening yeah that's uh, yeah i wouldn't normally touch on that but you 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 you've addressed this with such respect paul seriously you have that i i feel like we can touch on it without being disrespectful to people who've gone missing so yeah i think that it does it does make you wonder more questions yeah. les uh, Adam Sandor, is there anyone in the UFO uh, paranormal field that you particularly respect and why? Oh, loads of people. What can you say? You can respect anybody that will come out and tell their truth. Because at the end of the day, as you quite rightly say, Paul, it's the truth with no proof. How can you prove yeah. something that's on a different frequency that's not on our level? And this no, no. has been happening. For decades and centuries and over time in all over the world so i think it's only more recently as i've just said that we're getting a handle on it and being able to explain it so i, I respect a lot of people and you can't take it away from anybody who's putting the time in and the energy to try and analyze these things so from going back to the old days of uh jenny randall's uh even Don Keogh and some of these early or early ones that were really speaking out at the time uh, to more modern ones. Philip Kinsella, very eloquent young man, yourself, Paul. You know, I was gonna say, don't forget I gave you fifty pound earlier to send me first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope I'll, I'll be looking on my account then. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, sorry, go on. But even, I mean, the Philip Mantles of this world who's done the flying Dispress and helped other people as well. And it's not, Philip was, I, I can remember him from, well, I've known Philip for decades and decades and he's way back, he was much more sceptical than he is now. And he's changed yep. his tune over the years. Uh, but all, you've got to respect all these people that have put the time and effort in because everybody's putting their two pennies into the pot and we all can get something out of it. I, I, you know, I totally agree with you. And, you know, Philip's views might not be my views, but he's got so much to give to subject, and there's elements of what he's saying that, yeah, he, he's, he's, he's probably a lot closer to truth than me. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just uh, everybody's yeah. takes slightly different. And, and you, the list goes on. It's endless, Paul, isn't it? You, you literally oh, yeah. go on and on. You know, I'm I'm sure that there'll be a lot of people in chat who'll be taking a lot of from what you're saying today. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. It's, well, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah. it, oh, sorry. It's like, I wish I could talk with the well. I wish I could talk with the eloquence of uh, Philip Kinsella, the recall of Philip Mantle, the wit of Spiros Malaris. You know, there's all these other people that are good at what they do. You know, so yeah. they all contribute. Okay, Les. Okay, yeah. So at this point, I've just got to thank everybody who's uh, contributed uh, monetary wise to the channel. Thank you very much. I'll give a few name checks. Madeline Wick, thank you. TA uh, with a message saying double Paul, double bubble. So there <laughs> we go. Steve Lewis, thanks for your contribution. Great show tonight, gents. And Vincent Tomlinson, all very uh, welcome donations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna uh, um, what, sorry, Les. I just noticed somebody said Nick Pope were in chat earlier, and uh, I've reached out to Nick a few times. Obviously, I know you've spoke to him, Paul, in the past, and and I have. Uh, so I'll have another little go at him. We'll see if we can get uh, get him on here. You know, but uh, see what he wants to say. 
Go on, sorry. There you are, Nick. If you're still in the chat, Nick, mm. uh, you've just heard from Paul St. Clair. I'm well, to get you, on the show. you know, regardless of what anybody thinks or says, he was so generous with his time. That when we went to the awakening, not the last one, the, the, the one before, there were a lot of Americans there, some great speakers. So there's, I'm not labeling anybody, but the people that were around all day to interact with everybody who'd paid and wanted to just be part of the conference. I was, Kinsellas were, Daryl Sims were, and Nick Pope was. I think it speaks volumes. He, he spent time with people. So, but anyway, enough for me. Let's go on. Okay. And uh, Mark, see if I can get this. Uh, Mark Anderson, do you think they set us on a specific life path, Paul? In a word, no. Now, I have to say, to, to quantify that, I think we all have, uh, there's no such thing as coincidence. I believe that we all make the decisions when we decisions, but we are all where we are meant to be. There's no what ifs in life. There's no if onlys. What happened was meant to happen. So we're all on the path that we're supposed to be. We're all where we're supposed to be. We're all learning. We, we, we all, there's, there's a good old Buddhist proverb that says, you know, when the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear. And I firmly believe that. And there's a lot of things like on the spiritual side of things, people say when one door closes, another one will open. And it's the same sort of thing. And I think everybody is on a their personal path and their growth and that sort of thing. And I don't think it has anything to do with ET. No. Okay. My personal I, opinion. I, I, I sometimes wonder if, if we are being guided and if we are being... Uh, Oh, led yeah. in certain directions, I, but I don't know. Just... Well, it's how many times, right? It's like, we'll just say for an argument, say, the, how, the home that I'm in now, we were looking for a home and we'd passed this house twice and it, it had been sold. And then one day, it, I just, we got a bit more money, we could afford the deposit, whatever, and we were just, and I said, oh, we'll just call in. And they'd give back word, and suddenly, literally one hour before we got there, the house was back up for sale. And mm. the other things with neighbours, and there's this synchronicity in life where when something's meant to happen, it happens. It happens. And yeah. you go, you know. I would agree. I would agree with that, yeah. Okay, so I'll leave the, the last few uh, questions for a little bit later. Okay. About uh, four or five. So at this point, Paul, uh, Paul, uh, A, you sent me some photographs through for us to present on screen. So I think it, this will be the moment that we put some of these on the screen. You can yeah, talk through it. Yeah. So let's have a look then. And uh, here we go. So. What right. are we looking at there, Paul? We know we're looking at an anomalous light in the sky. Is that a yes. television aerial in the bottom? It's actually a leaf off a tree in the bottom. That I'll just put okay. the top of the tree. Okay. Um, but what that was uh, one afternoon, middle of the afternoon, and my wife and I uh, at the same time saw this, what we initially thought was a balloon. Uh, but it was very high up. It went behind cloud. So it was very high. Then I thought, if this is high and above that cloud, that's massive. It's got to be like 100 foot deep. Plus, it, it, imagine if it was like a rugby ball, uh, yep. but vertically. But the top sort of third of it was shrouded in cloud. The bottom was clear and the top was shrouded in cloud. And it moved into the wind, not against the wind. And it was moving quite quickly. And I was very fortunate that I had my camera handy and I managed to take one picture. I took another one, but it was too far away in the cloud, but it was moving quick. Uh, again, no rotation, no noise, no anything. It was just this vertical white, anomalous, rubbish ball-shaped white moving into the wind very quickly. Uh, sort of in a northeasterly direction uh, from, I would say, like south south of Leeds, uh, right. moving north that way. And, and you, do you know, Paul, I mean, obviously you've caught it there and I'm glad you've got that little bit in for reference in bottom of the, of the leaf. But d did you find that it were even more 
of a visual experience than the actual picture when you were looking at oh, it. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Just to go on. <laughs> now, this is something else that I always say why we never get, we, and you never will, get good, clear pictures of UFOs. And if you think about it logically, going back to the frequencies and the energy uh, and going back onto that type of thing, we only see, and we our cameras only work on these specific frequencies. So if you've got something made of energy that's moving in different frequencies and there's just that portion of it within our visible spectrum, you're only seeing a, maybe 25% of it. So you're not seeing the whole thing. I'm not saying it's any bigger or smaller. I'm just saying it, your camera won't focus on what it's not able to. So that's yeah. why we don't get clear pictures because you're not seeing the whole object. You're just seeing that specific frequency that the camera picks up, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And that's mainly why I were asking you, to be honest. So you just hit us yeah. with that one. Go on, let's next one, please. <laughs> what we're looking now, at this, here. This one was in September 19... Uh, yeah, September 2021. Nearly said 1921 then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And one night, uh, we live in a small cul-de-sac where all the houses look in on each other. And the kids have been playing out and everybody there. And as I'm putting things away in the garage, I notice this extremely bright pinpoint white light in the sky. And it was like, I shouldn't be able to see that in the middle of the day. You know, I, it was like looking at a very bright star. So Eve was in the house. I knocked on the door. So quick, bring me binoculars. Come and look at this. A few of the neighbours were out. And in the end, it was almost due east from our position, uh, maybe 60, 70 degrees up. But it moved very, very slowly towards us onto a more vertical position. Now, me trying to zoom in, you can see there that it's uh, it, it did, the camera won't pick it up. You can see little things around it. Now, I sent another photograph, Les, that you may be able to show, I don't know, it was a like a donut shape. No, not that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes, no, that's the one. That Perfect. one. Yeah, yeah, that one. So that was exactly what it was like, except it was brilliant white, and you could see the the smaller ones around it. Now they had these sort of, if you can imagine, an in iridescent contrast of light, but the big one stayed stationary. And the other ones around it uh, were flickering on and off, like in and out of our visual range. And um, some of them were moving really fast. Uh, and I, I've got some, I've got my trusty old Carl Zeiss 10 by 50s. But we had this in sight for half an hour. And there were 13 people saw this. There were eight adults and five children. And we had time, it was at the front of our home. So I opened the garage and I got the, uh, garden recliners out and two of us were actually laid on our backs nearly on the recliner because I've got some very heavy duty uh, 25 by 70s night vision binoculars uh, well this they, they, they for star watching but looking at it through them you could see that detail now this was uh, one of our friends on the internet Richard Lenny and he put this on from another uh, witness sighting but this is exactly how it was so I've just used that picture to illustrate that's what it was really like and we had that in sight for, for over half an hour and then I actually had time to go in the house and get my telescope and I'm setting the telescope up because I thought right I'm really going to look at this close and as I was setting it up uh, my wife and my neighbour suddenly shouted out and it zoomed off to the north and we didn't see it again Right. Do you think that will be by design, or do you think it will just it just moved away? There's no thought process now, going on. <laughs> that's another good question, uh, because I do believe that not always, but I think sometimes, like uh, maybe on this occasion, we're just witnesses to them working, if you like, and they just happen to be some of it within our frequency, so we see <clears> that. <throat> but on other occasions, you do get that physical connection. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I might have to go back to that previous one then, Paul. Yeah, 
that previous one, right? That was, I was actually falling asleep. It's wonderful. When you get old, you can go on these coach holidays like people do. And my, my, we've been on quite a few. And my wife was asleep behind me. And I reclined my seat. You know, these coaches are really posh now. They have reclining seats and cushions. and But they're wonderful for looking at the sky because the glass, although it's double glazed, it's darkened. So you can just look at the sky with your normal eyes. You don't have to squint and do this. And you can look at the whole sky. And on this occasion, we'd been down to Longleat and around that area and Wiltshire and everywhere down there. And when we're driving back up past Warminster and Westbury, and as I did, I saw a flash. I'm just laid there with my seat reclined, looking at the sky. And there was a flash in the sky. So like what everybody does, you try to rationalise things. So I'm trying, oh, it's just a flash in the sky. I'll just, so I kept looking. And then there was another flash, which was in, I can't see in exactly the same place, but it was in the same area of sky. So I'm looking, by now it's got my attention. So I'm looking more, waiting. And then all of a sudden, this thing just appeared like something coming out of fog and it was a barble shape white barble shaped like a ufo two halves may have been joined in the middle and it was like my god got my phone out started taking pictures now think on i'm on a moving coach through glass i must have taken <laughs> 20 pictures and this is the only thing i got on any of them but yeah. looking at it through that from a, as a digital camera well digital as it can be from a mobile phone. It's more like a hot water cylinder or something, isn't it? Yeah. But again, yeah. what I've seen a different frequency with my naked eye to what the camera were picking up, I don't know. But I was looking at it as a barbell. The camera picked it up as a cylindrical shape. And then, literally after 10 seconds maybe, it just faded away and I never saw it again. It's gone. Yeah. Oh, and uh, we did that one, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we've yeah. done that. Yeah. We'll, go. we'll go to this um, one then, Paul. Yeah, that's a good one. The uh, a lady that I know who's seen UFOs on several occasions, this is near Wakefield, <clears> and she just got up one morning, opened the curtains, and there was that in the sky. And she sort of went, oh, my God, got a phone, took a picture, and it came out. And I actually sent that off to be analysed, and they just said it was something solid that was obviously reflecting the sun. I don't know if you can zoom in on it, Les, but it was, uh, there was one very similar in America around about the same time. Uh, and it seemed to be like in four compartments. It looks sort of cylindrical, yeah. but it was in four pieces. But, it it uh, doesn't like it. <clears throat> okay, don't worry, it was just. You can, you can definitely see four yeah. points of light on it anyway, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Any more, yeah. Les? Yeah. Uh, I'll see if I can zoom in. I'd, uh... No, I can't. Uh, okay, this... so we're running with this one, then, Paul. Yeah. Now, in the middle of the black circle, there's a white or silver ball. I don't yep. know if you can make it out. You can see uh, it, yeah. Yeah. Then... I, think, I think you did a, um, a zoom-in yeah. shot, didn't you? Is that the zoom-in shot? Go. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it seems to be one of these silver spheres, these balls that we get quite common. Uh, and it's funny, only last week, I think, or no, it'd be a few mm. weeks ago now, before I came out, uh, I was talking to Philip Kinsella about this. Because if you remember, both himself and Ronald had the uh, experience with the grandma in the garden, where this all the yeah. yeah. that moved across. Yeah. And I think this is quite commonplace. On the other sighting I had, they seem to be the silver balls that were zooming about and flickering in and out of, of sight. Uh, and this guy was actually uh, lived in Harrogate and was on the road with his wife to Ripon. And they both saw it together. Uh, his wife saw it first, but then he noticed it as well. And they actually pulled up uh, and took a few photographs. And he was, he was like, wow, you know. But this very common. And I think, uh, again, how many people actually report something like this to the authorities? I know we have, um, like MUFON and other agencies where people do report UFOs, but how many are not reported, you know? 
Yeah. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Just bear with me, guys. We have got we have got a malfunction. No oh, problem, lads. Just take your time. Oh, that that was yeah. a video that. Was... Sorry, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to remove them because it's there's somewhat playing up here, guys. No yeah. problem. <clears throat> so, so you've got a few questions before we sort of wind this down. So I'll I'll go back to just talking with Paul then for ten minutes if you want, Les. Uh, yeah, let's have a look. Um, I've got about four or five. Do you want to save them while later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's save them and uh, and then we'll just we'll just kick a few more ideas about now. And I'm just okay. looking at people I've missed in chat. Jim's James Mailer, Fortian, Fred Flintstone, uh, and Lee, uh, Chris James, and Dan as well. Dan. So, and I know I've missed loads of people. So apologies, but. Thanks for support, guys. So just before we jump into some more questions, Paul, the book, UFOs, The Real Story, where can people find this book or your right. book? It's, it's available on Amazon uh, as an e-book, as a hardback, as a paperback, or on Kindle. Well, yeah, that's Kindle. As an audio book as well. Uh and it's just my experiences. People have asked why I've, I've put UFOs, the real story, because what I've tried to do is connect the different pieces of the pie, as, as we've said. And there you go. And I, th I think it's uh, something that more of us need to look at. And I'm not taking anything away from anybody with their own uh, field of research and their specific way of doing things. However, I think it does us more good to sit back or stand back, take a step back and look at what people are doing and join the dots because I do believe that everything's connected. And what I've tried to do with this book, people have said, well, why didn't you start with UFOs? And I said, because that's not how it happened. I've tried to do things on a chrono chronological order of how they happened in my life and my little experiences. So you get spiritual things first, uh, and then it seems to go into UFOs, and it's it's just the way that's how it happened to me. So, so spiritual things, ghosts, poltergeists. What are your views? What are your experiences? The <laughs> uh, I know I know you've to... touched on yeah yeah we've got we've got thirty minutes, but we've got fifteen minutes because we're going to do some questions in fifteen minutes. The I've experienced poltergeist phenomena, seen spirit, uh, spiritual healing, and they're all specific things that happen to me, premonitions. And I believe that in some ways, uh, what can I say? It, it's a way of educating me. And it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritual healer. I don't, I'm not clairvoyant. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not, a spiritual side but unlike this like you would say the spiritualist you know where they say the clairvoyant clairaudient they do psychometry or whatever i don't seem to have any of that but i've experienced it uh which makes you stop and think my god this it's not just people experience people's interpretation of what's happening to them this thing was real you know this is what yeah. really happened uh and it's so you said a it's way a way of, of educating you. Do you think? Yeah. So do you think some out external force is doing that then? And it's not a trick question because I realised when I said, do you think that we're all being, yeah, these experiences we're all having are sort of pre-laid into our lives throughout life. Yeah. And you said you didn't oh. think that was the case, but you said <laughs> this is a way. Was, that it's a, yeah. Right. I'll, I'll just give you an, an example. There was. There was uh, I was brought up, uh, initially when I was little, I was dedicated a Methodist. Then I was brought up Church of England. It seems like every time we moved house, we changed religion. But <laughs> I was brought up Ch Church of England, where I was baptised, christened, and all the rest of it. And then when I was 11 years old, we moved uh, onto the edge of this village where I had my first UFO sighting. But literally 50 yards from our home was a spiritualist church. And some of my father's work colleagues went to the spiritualist church. So it's like anything else. When you're human, you just go wherever mum and dad take you. So you, we went to the spiritualist church. Now, eventually, I was 
what well, well, the spiritually is called the naming ceremony. So it's like their equivalent to a baptism is a naming ceremony. So I've been dedicated Methodist, baptized Church of England, and named a spiritualist. And I think they're all wrong. But anyway, I'm not saying they're completely wrong. Religion is, in my opinion, the wrong way about doing things. Spirituality doesn't need religion. And it's something, uh, a way that I've come to believe now that religion is man-made. And it's the, like, like we said earlier, it's your ethics, your morals, and the way you conduct yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, this, and the man-made so, religion, is that just a way to control the populace? Yes. Um, and it's, it's like, there were somebody uh, put sort of a picture on Facebook uh, of these American Indians out in the woods next to a stream. And he said, look at these people. He says, they go to inside a building to worship their God, where we can sit out here and he talks to us, you know. Yeah. And it's that sort of thing, just being aware of it. But anyway, the reason I'm telling you this, <laughs> like once I got into my teens, like most teenagers, mum and dad and everything else goes, take a back seat and you're thinking of girls and cars or on the other, boys and cars, whatever you want. But anyway, there's other things you're sort of part of growing up that everybody does. Uh, and I'm walking past the church one day and there's this old guy in a brown pinstripe three-piece suit stood outside the back door of the spiritualist gym smoking a cigarette and i didn't know him uh, i think I mean, you're now you're now going to give me the answer to the question i was going to ask you so go on sorry i had to get it in yeah so as as i i'm walking past uh and it, it was like again teenagers in them the only time you went to church was christenings births funeral all the rest of it you know the usual thing but as a as a teenager you weren't a free, we didn't go frequently. So I didn't know this guy. I'm walking past the church, and as I'm walking past, he's smoking away. And then he went, Paul. And I, I didn't know him, but he obviously knew me. And he went, Have you got a minute? So I went, Respect for your elders. So I don't think I said much, but I just walked over towards him. And he says, uh, Just a minute. And he goes in his pocket like this, gets a scrappy bit of paper out and a little pencil, probably from local bookkeepers or something. And he starts <laughs> writing something down. And then he shows it like this. And it was this little scrappy bit of paper. And it just said on it, UFO, the three letters. And he just said, I've been told by spirit to tell you you're thinking on the right lines. And it was like, What? Yeah. I've never met this man before in my life and he's like and it's just again it's affirmations like that and things that mm. like you blow your mind and you think my god and they sort of nudge you back on the right path again you know yeah so and you might not be able to recall anything but in the time that you visit because I were going to ask you did you get a message did you get anything that's kind of nailed it for you that, that there's something the unknown other is at work. But in the time that you visited the spiritualist church, did you see anybody receive any, any messages or anything startling other than your own messages? Were anything that is there any particular account that sticks in your mind? Uh, yes and no. Because it, this is a thing that happened, because obviously every spiritualist church will get members of the audience that go week in, week out and all the rest of it and do it as a spiritual and as a church thing, like people do. But you also get people that lose loved ones or whatever, or go, come on, they'll say, you know. So you'll, you'll always get people that go to spiritual church simply because they want, or they're looking for confirmation or the affirmation that there is life after death and all the rest of it. And they want that, that their loved ones are all right. So you'll also get that side of it. So I did see a lot of messages where people got the confirmation if you want and the you know sort of the help if you like yeah. that they need it uh, but also one of the things I won't go into detail now but one of the chapters in my book is specifically about goes on from that last with the gentleman telling me about UFOs and goes on from that uh, and you'd actually be surprised uh, 
at the amount of spiritualist church that are getting messages from ET. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, seriously. And I, I, I know that you're not, we haven't got time anyway, but I know you're not going to talk in detail about that. But I would love to talk to somebody, you, Paul, or anyone who's got information on that because, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, there's, a, there's a medium in Bridlington that claims that he has an, an ET, for want of a better word. I found myself saying it now. I don't know whether they're ET, so I just know that it's the unknown other. And, uh, Claims that this this being comes through and gives him messages, yeah. and so, yeah. so I find that fascinating. Um, do, do you want to stay with that, or jumping from that? Do you think there's been a change in attitudes towards the subject of UFOs uh, over the last five, six years? Do you think people have changed their attitude? I think the cryptid phenomenon is still years behind. Uh, you know, yeah. still people are still scratching their heads and thinking, "I can't believe this." despite the, the credible witnesses that are coming forward. Yeah. We'll, we'll stay with UFOs. Has there been a change in attitude? Yeah. And again, I think it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, where we get in this psychological drip feed of this is acceptable. This is what's really happening. So you're getting, look how many UFO programs are on television now. Look how many films there are now. Look how much more, it's becoming much more mainstream. Uh, so people are getting this, there's always something on where they never used to be, you know. So the, the, the drip feed, we, we're perhaps give, being given the, the part of disclosure that they want to give us, aren't they? But yes, So, so are, are, we, are we seeing more or are, are people just more happy to talk about them, more happy to admit, oh, yeah, I did see something strange? Is that the scenario I, that's happened? I think there's both happening. Uh, I, I do believe we see more than we ever used to, but also people are not as reticent where before it was something like, oh, you know, I'm not talking about that or like people used to do and people were told to be quiet and all the rest of it. I think this is becoming more mainstream and more acceptable for all people. And I find now when people, I talk to people about it, I'm getting a much better, as you may know yourself, much much better reception, yeah, from it. So, so I suppose it's 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 not a yes or a no answer. But what about the cryptid phenomena then? Because I, 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 just briefly for myself, somebody that I've said it loads of times. If somebody that said to me, "Look, let, you'll be looking into this ten years ago," I, I don't mean I'd have laughed at them, but I, I just wouldn't have embraced it. I won't laugh at anybody who talks about seeing things of a strange nature. But it weren't something I, I, I'm always quick to say, don't label me as a cryptid researcher, it's multi phenomena. But yeah, the, the, right. the, the, I, I like to think that what we're doing, what me and Les have done with Wolfland, is giving people the confidence to come forward and share their own experiences where they wouldn't necessarily have done before. We're not breaking new ground. I realize that there's lots of other great researchers out there. And, and if that's the word, researchers, if it is, then everybody in chat's a researcher because we're all looking for answers. But even that's getting talked about more. Are the, are the cryptids then, Paul? See, same question. Are they being seen more? Or are we becoming more accept of, accepting of the fact that they could actually be a reality? Yeah, I think, you see, I think it's the latter of the two. I don't think they're seen now any more than they used to be. But I think people are more aware of it and more accepting of it than they used to be. Yeah. So... And it, again, it goes back to communication and everything else. That the you know the internet and all the information at your fingertips that never used to be. So, so let's before we get to questions, let's have another. What about remote viewing? Have you have you looked in? Pardon the pun. Have you looked into that? Have you you know have have you any knowledge of that, or have you ever found that you've been able to do it even when the mind's been kind of been detached? As the subtitle of book two for me, Beyond the Thinking Mind. Yeah. Any knowledge of I that? Think, I not specifically, but I will say that I do believe that the people can do this, and I do believe they can get a lot of information and it can be very accurate as well. If you imagine uh going back to the Robert Munro's and the outer body experiences, if people that can control it to that extent, and some people can why wouldn't the government be interested? Because 
they can send that spirit and get the information that they want. So I think there's a lot of this clandestine things been going on that we will never find out about. Again, going on to the disclosure thing with UFOs, and it's the same with remote viewing. Yes, I believe it's a real thing. Yes, I can believe it can be really accurate. And yes, I do believe that both sides in the Cold War really experimented and went with this, but they're just not letting us know. But I do believe it's a real thing. It, it's, it's fascinating when you think about it, Paul, isn't it? The remote oh, viewing. Yeah. And we, we know that governments of the world have actively participated in these experiments with uh, remote viewers. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing to it if we hear academia and science in, in many aspects speak about it. Same with UFOs. We've got the we've got a subject where we get freedom information requests and we get replies back. Nothing of any significant, you know, defense significance. There's nothing to any of this. It's all a load of rubbish. Yet then we discover that they've been looking into it. Not just for decades, but well, I would have think since before, yeah. since officialdom first decided that these yeah. things were significant. I get, you know, it's for something of no significance. There's a lot of effort gone into keeping it right. under wraps. Yeah, two little stories. I'll just very quickly. Uh, I was I worked for the ambulance service for 28 years, uh, and years ago I was at a small town. And the, we had area managers that used to come round. Uh, and I made no secret of the fact that I was into UFOs and all the rest of it. And one day I'm on the, I was on the response car and I was on the station. I'd just had my lunch and this area manager came in his car. Whatever. And then he walked in, there was only me and him in the garage and he walked towards me and he went, Paul, you're into UFOs, aren't you? And I went, yeah. He says, do you think they're real? I went, there's no question. Absolutely they're real. And then he says, I'll just tell you, he says, my daughter is an officer in the Navy. He said, and she works in an office block in Liverpool and she has for the British government and she has people under her. She's not the boss. But, I mean, he made it sound like, I can't remember exactly now, but maybe 15 people. And he says her job specifically is to do with the UFOs and investigating alien technology. And he said, Paul, he says, I'm a dad. And she won't tell me any more. She won't tell me anything. Yeah, it's it's incredible, isn't it? You know, I, I mean, not not as deep as that, but uh, in I think it, it, it might have been two thousand eleven. My son in law Luke took some footage of an object over Staxton radar base. Oh yeah, we, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah we put a freedom of information. This was at the time when they said that they discontinued looking into UFOs. And there was nothing to it, and they, they weren't dealing with public uh, reports or, or, or uh, you know, the public that send in letters asking for explanations and things anymore. And when we put the freedom information request in, we got back that all UFO reports were now we sent it to RF Staxton Wold, and I, the the commander at RF Staxton Wold or whatever his title was said that all UFO reports are now sent to RF Leeming, and we got the letter. So, and this is when they'd said they were no longer actively looking into UFOs, yeah. you know, and but yeah, it, just a little, it let it slip kind of thing, you know, and yeah. it's, not, it's not the smoking gun, is it? But it's still fascinating. And it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to pull his ear, Les in yeah. and see if we can do some more. Is that okay, Paul? Yeah, fine. Yes, if we can, uh, uh, I'll fire this one because it did come in early and, uh, uh, Karen. So sorry for the uh, late question from Karen, because she did uh, deliver this at five minutes past seven. Have you had any interaction with any form of elemental energies? Uh, and she says, thank you. Right. In a word, no. I've had experience with poltergeist when I was a teenager in Holland, but nothing with any elemental energies. I'm aware of what, what they are and sort of around them, but... <laughs> As I said at the beginning, my path seemed to be going down the UFO route uh, rather yeah. than the paranormal yeah. route. But it says I've got mature and sort of retired and started looking into other things that I realised that they're all part of the bigger picture. Yeah. Okay. I've got Thank a you. question from Matt Jones. Are we all creating what's around us at any given time? In a word, yes. All the time. Because... Your thoughts, the way you think, 
your energy that's what comes back to you yes it's nice to say we're all on a path we're all on a learning curve we're all trying to better ourselves and do whatever but if you're uh, a negative person it's like i know a, a good friend who's very negative in these they speak badly of everything <laughs> and then when something bad is like why is it always happening to me sort of thing and then you get the boot on the other foot where uh, a guy i was in the army with chris akabusi he was my pta when i was in the uh, in the, army the runner early. yeah not the runner oh no, okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I met two out of that team, Roger Black and uh, Chris. But Chris was uh, with us in the army in Berlin. Uh, and he now does motivational speaking and the power of positive thinking. Because that uh, it's a real thing. The way that you think, people don't realise it's an energy. So if you're thinking bad thoughts, it's bad energy, negative energy. So course, yeah. you've got to try and stop that and think, you know, how can I be more positive? How am I going to get something good to me? You, whatever you put out, that's what you're going to get back. And he'd done mm. some wonderful speaking. The first time I saw him after I'd left the army was my brother got some tickets for one of his talks in Bradford. And he went, oh, do you want to go? And I went, oh, yeah, I'll go see him. And he's just the same as you see him. That's how he's in real life. But it's because it works. It's a positive energy. And every, when people understand that we are an energy being having an earthly experience, and it's the way that you think, and that influences everything around you all the time. So be positive. It it even shapes throughout life the way we look in a way, doesn't it? And you can see it in some people's face faces, can't you? And all sort of, uh, do you know what I mean? It, 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 I think so. You know, it's uh, anyway yeah. a little bit of grief, and they look like they've got angst all the time. So, yeah. and uh, we've got Andy Decodes. Uh, Welcome, Andy, if you're still with us. Uh, do you think orbs could be combined energy of different entities, Paul? Right. <coughs> uh, yes. Now, yeah. one of the things that I uh, experienced that I had with orbs, I was in past no, I wasn't in Pascagoula, I'm telling people. I was in Casadega in America, a little place, maybe, I, I don't know, 10 miles outside of uh, Daytona Beach. Uh, and I didn't know anything about it. And Paul Merton did a, uh, a show of the alternate America. And one of the things was he went to this Casadega, which was a spiritual retreat. So some friends that we had at the time had lost a daughter in a tragic accident. And they wanted to go for a reading because there were all these. So while we were there and waiting, they said, and it was a weekend, are you here to do the orb walk? And we went, what's the orb walk? And it was like something that they did on a Friday and Saturday night where the local minister, spiritual minister, and they got together. And they used to have paranormal groups that go as well. So anyway, while we waited, the church was being repaired. So it was everybody was gathering in the village hall. And it was laid out like a church. So I'm instead of walking down the middle, middle aisle and altar, I'm walking down one side. And as I walk down one side of it, this... I'm near this picture, and then I felt something at the side of me, like somebody had walked right up to the side of me, and all my hair stood on end and stood on my arm, and they were my wife and my friends, and she was stood there with the camera in her hand, and I said, Eve, take my picture now, and she just took my picture, and then the feeling went away, and I said, right, come here, and literally, can't have been more than 30 seconds, she was stood in exactly the same spot, and I took her picture. When I got that feeling, and she took the picture, there were seven orbs on the photograph around me, and they were available. When I took her picture, she didn't feel anything, and there were no orbs on the picture. So where you get these programs where, if, if you think about it, it was like uh, Most Haunted with Yvette Fielding and her gang, and where she said, you know, the, it was the advent of digital photography that these orbs became sort of widespread knowledge and whether that was what was being picked up of spirit from uh, on a, in a, on a digital from a digital platform's point of view, that's always been debatable. But I have to say that's what I experienced, and it appeared very. And you real did feel me. that. You did feel that kind of energy. Yeah, I felt yeah. it, and we had the photographic proof as well. That's superb. 
Joey Hayes is asking, does Paul Askoff have any first-hand poltergeist experiences? Yeah. Uh, mm. I didn't like it, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Very briefly, uh, I went on a holiday with school. All teenagers, and like usual things, you'd always put in schools or student accommodation. And we were in Volkenberg in Holland. And I give the full account of it in my book. But what happened basically, we're in student accommodation. And it's a, like a small block of flats, maybe five stories high, central staircase, dormitories with six or eight beds in, teacher's room at one end where the staircase was and a toilet at the other. And that was it. Dead basic, usual student accommodation. On the last night, the girls in one dorm, boys in the other, and the girls were screaming and carrying on and complaining. Uh, and one of the boys was like, he said, Paul, you better go in there. Now, I don't know, they knew that I was a spiritualist, but not that, you know, go and sort them out. So I goes in and they'd been hearing proper rapping on the outside of the building. Now, we were maybe 56 feet up, but there were only bushes around it. There were no electrical cables, no trees, no anything. Uh, and I'm, it's a typical long rectangular room, two windows at the far end, two windows down the side, uh, and that was all. There was just very basic, maybe three or four beds down either side. So I'm stood by the doorway. The doorway opens like this, and there's a light switch here. So I'm looking into the room, and the girls are saying, there's knocking on this, so I'm thinking it'll be mice in the walls. It's, you know, not very well upkeep and all the rest of it anyway as i'm thinking this there's this knock and it was literally like somebody was knocking on the wall on the outside of the building which were an impossibility but that's exactly what it sounded like typical pose the guy's knocking and i thought whoa straight away i knew this was odd you get it's something else that you get now this is something else paul you get a feeling you get a connection you know there's something there and then it knocked again further down so all the girls are like like this with the blankets up to the faces, up the noses and crying and carrying on. And then it went round the outside of the building. Then it went down the long side. And it was all, for all the world, like we were on the ground floor and somebody was walking around the outside of the building, rapping really hard with the knuckles on the outside. It was very weird. And it was like, I'm thinking, my God. Then it got, it went down past the building and the, on the, where the toilet was, it was one of them where the window or pushed it up on a latch and then you could let the latch go and it flapped down. Mm. And the toilet window slammed shut. Well, I'm sort of looking that way and the toilet's just there. And then as I turned to look back in the room, the light switch, which was in my line of sight looking at the girls, was up like this. And as I looked at it, the toggle on the light switch just went and went off and the light went out. All the girls screamed, all my hair stood on end, and it was like, whoa. And I thought <laughs> it was pure reaction. I just turned the light switch back on. And as I turned the light switch back on, the feeling went and I knew it had gone. And it was yeah. like, yeah. but you could feel it, you know. What do you think they're doing? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to let's get on with the next question because I'm going to say, is it feeding on off our energy? But yeah. Ross, Ross deserves this question. Uh, yeah, we don't have much time to so devote yeah. to answering the remaining questions. But uh, if you want to tackle them, Paul, have a go. And the time slip phenomenon. Uh, and again, I think it's this where you're going from one record to another, you're going from one dimension to another. And as it, you, they call it, it's a different vibration, a different frequency. People call it parallel universes, whatever. But I think they're on a different timeline to us. And that's why you get this difference in time. And that's why you get these instances of. Uh, differences in time with people disappearing and reappearing and the thing like like on that uh, guy with the yeah. light aircraft that appeared before he could do. Okay, thanks for the question, uh, Ross. I've got a question from, let's show this one, Chris James. Uh, Paul, the photo of the row of lights, did the woman mention if the lights were rotating at all? No, they were stationary. Okay. Uh, and that, that was what got attention, really. She said it was almost like, you know how we see these uh, huge lights that are on a pole above a motorway? She says it was like one of those in the middle of nowhere. But it just was hanging. Uh, obviously like just hanging there, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mark Jones, will the alien fake invasion go ahead? 
<laughs> oh, Mark, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but, but at least we know it's going to be a fake alien invasion. We will never get an, an alien invasion. It's not going to happen, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, right, let's uh, have a look, see if I can fire through these last few questions. The disabled Welshman, what is a smoking gun when it comes to UFOs? Uh, it has to be really quick on this one, Paul. Uh, and and yeah. I want to ask something before we do, we've done, but yeah, go on. All right. Yeah, no idea. It's At the end of the day, <laughs> it's a first, because it's a personal <laughs> thing. And you get that connection with whatever you see and whatever you experience. I've got, I've got to thank uh, Karen Beeman for the monetary donation tonight. And she said, fabulous chat this evening. And uh, oh, thank, thank you, you very much. So I've got to get that one in. Well, on that note then, people, if you are in the chat now and you can see this like and subscribe button, it's totally free. I say it every time, just give it a press. It, it supports us. If you were interested in what I'm doing, what I'm about, the truthproof.uk website where Don Lodge puts all the reports on and the books are available on the website, the paperbacks, and you can get the Kindle versions on Amazon. And you can also look at our, and I'm going to say our incredible Wolflands DVD on Amazon Prime as well. And Paul's just earlier told you about where you can obtain his book on Amazon. Yeah, Thanks, and Yeah, and don't forget, we've got our TikTok uh, channel. And uh, for those who do use TikTok, not, I know not everybody does, please go over there and just give us a follow. It'll just help us boost a little bit. So there is uh, lots of snippets of lots of Paul's uh, stories and accounts on there if you want to pop over and have a look. And we're Thank adding you. more every day, so that's brilliant. Uh, so the last words from you two guys. Well, I'm going to leave last word to Paul Askoff, so I'm going to say good night to Les, good night to Paul, and over to you, Paul Askoff. Well, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure anytime. And I'm sure there's much more bases that we could have covered, but it's nice that we're able to explain and go through and put fingers out there and cover what we did. Yeah, and just one last sentence. What's the name of the book and where can people find it, Paul? It's UFOs, The Real Story, available on Amazon. And it's, uh, what can I say? Helps you think outside the box. Yeah. And, and, uh, you've done that tonight. Yeah, and the all links are in the tonight's description of the show. And on that note, we'll see you all next time. Bye Thank for now. You.